Thank you, and, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this splendid forum. Um, uh, father of 3D printing is, is a little bit of an exaggeration. It sounds as if I originated it. I certainly didn't invent 3D printing. It was, it's been around for 30 years, and I started working on 3D printing uh, uh, early in this century. Um, now, I'm not going to say an enormous amount about the technology of 3D printing, but I do want to say something about uh, its special capabilities in terms of technology in general and how it might change the way manufacturing gets done in the future. Now, you'll notice that my title is Manufacturing Manufacturing. What I'm talking here about is self-replicating machines, and 3D printing will be an example of this. And what I want to address is something that's already been mentioned in this forum today and indeed has been mentioned widely in the press over the last few years. Um, it's the idea that AI and robotics is going to lead to considerable changes in the way we work and possibly to mass redundancies and unemployment as more and more work is done by machines, leaving nothing for human beings to do. Now, when you look at me, you'll be able to see that I'm terribly old. And there are very few advantages to being terribly old, but one of them is that you get to see cycles of things going round and recognize them for what they are, the, the long periodicities in, in human affairs and human events. And this particular idea, the idea that technology is going to make everybody redundant, uh, is an idea that I've seen three times in my life. Uh, the first time was when I was in my late childhood, when mainframe computers were becoming widespread. And there were documentaries on television, I remember seeing them, uh, saying that soon nobody will be working. Um, and there was a newspaper article I read saying that we weren't going to have enough room for all the golf courses that we needed because nobody would be working anymore and so we'd need so many golf courses for people to spend their leisure time. That didn't happen. <laughs> um, the second time uh, that this idea came about was in my early middle age when the microcomputer started to become widespread. And once again, everybody said, nobody will be working in the future, machines will do everything. And again, it didn't happen. Now, this time, maybe it will. I mean, all we can say is that for induction from two examples is probably not very statistically sound. Um, but even if it doesn't lead to mass unemployment, it will certainly lead the introduction of AI and robotics to radical changes in the way that most human beings are employed, even if they continue to be employed. Um, so let's look at making things and how human beings go about creating wealth in the traditional way. Now, everything in this room, the clothes you're wearing, the tables you're sitting at, the projector that's projecting my slides onto the screen, uh, were all manufactured by companies. Things are made in the world by companies. So let's start by looking at companies. And let's start by looking at the biggest companies in the world. Um, according to Forbes magazine, the world's biggest company of all is the International Bank of China. And these companies are so big that we have to go to exponential notation in order to describe their size. Um, the International Bank of China has 3.3 times 10 to the 12 dollars in assets, uh, which according to Forbes makes it the world's biggest company. And we go on down the list, and the first thing we discover is that the first six companies on the list don't actually make anything at all. The Bank of China and all the others are actually financial institutions of various sorts, and all they do, all these top six companies in the world, is they maintain a list of numbers in their computers, and their one function is to ensure that when they subtract a value from one of those numbers, they add exactly the same number to another value, another number somewhere else. That is all these companies do, the top, top six of them, and they're the biggest companies in the world. We have to come right down to number seven, ExxonMobil, uh, at 3.5 times 10 to the 11 dollars in market capitalization uh, for the first company that does something other than changing numbers around. Now, I realize that market capitalization and assets are not quite the same thing. Uh, of course, different companies have different ways and different measures. Excuse me, I'm just going to take a small drink before I 
drauf. Exxon Mobil, as I say, number seven on the list, is the first company that actually produces something physical. Uh, we all know what they do. They take dead dinosaurs out of the ground and they put them into the petrol tanks of our motor cars. Um, and we carry on down the list. And the first engineering company that manufactures items at number 11 is Toyota, 2.4 times 10 to the 11 dollars market capitalization. And then immediately below Toyota is number 12, Apple, sometimes called the biggest company in the world at 7.4 times 10 to the 11 dollars market capitalization. Um, Apple, Apple, it is certainly true to say, does have the biggest market capitalization, but that doesn't necessarily make it the world's biggest company. Uh, so these are the tops of the lists, a selection of them. I haven't put all, of, all, it, all 12 at the top in there, but you get the general picture of what's going on. Um, let's now look, instead of at the world's biggest companies, at the world's biggest industry. What the world's biggest industry is won't come as a surprise when you think about it. It's this one. Or it is if I press the right button. Um, the world's biggest industry is food. As I say, that's not surprising. We all eat, and this is not only the world's biggest industry, it's our single most important industry. If the indus this industry weren't there, we'd all be starving, all seven billion of us. Um, now, there are some big companies associated with the distribution of food, but the actual production, the farming part of it, um, those people who do that, and some of them are companies, and some of them, of course, are just individuals, they don't grow very large at all. And this is a strange thing. Why should it be that the world's biggest industry does not have one of the world's biggest companies associated with it? What is it about farming that prevents it from accumulating in an enormous size to the size, say, of Toyota, or one of those banks that I mentioned. Now, this is only a hypothesis from me. I don't know if this is true, and it's not something, as far as I've been able to tell, that's been researched. But I think that the reason why farming doesn't grow big is because uniquely among all human industries and wealth-creating activities, it is entirely based on self-replication. Everything that a farmer does is to grow plants and animals, and those plants and animals are self-copying. And it seems to me that that is the reason why farming doesn't get big. It's because anyone can do it. There's a continual supply of people coming in at the bottom. It's very easy. Of course, you need land, but quite a few people have access to land. It's very easy to start off in a small way. Almost no capital is required. I can grow plants in my garden, some of which feed me, um, and the amount of money required for me to start doing that is almost zero. Now, that's not to say that farming everywhere in the world is easy. Of course, sometimes it's quite difficult. But of course, in general and on average, it's based, as I say, on things that copy themselves. And because it's based on things that copy themselves, things that grow, you don't actually have to do any manufacturing yourself. The things manufacture themselves. Um, large numbers of people can get involved in it, and it tends to stay distributed among those large numbers of people. It doesn't ac accumulate together in economies of scale, and we'll talk about economies of scale in a, in a little while. Let's look now at manufacturing in another way. Um, here's a pie chart of global annual manufacturing output. Now, I should warn you to take the figures here with a little bit of um, uh, uh, not to trust them absolutely. Uh, I work them out myself. It's almost impossible to find values for this in the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, indeed, I couldn't find any. I could find some numbers on which I based these figures, um, but they are only my calculation. They're not something that has been itself peer-reviewed. And I've split global manual manufacturing into two, into two rather unequal sections, as you can see here. Um, let's see if I can get a pointer. No, I can't. No, the screen is unfortunately too bright for the pointer to show up. Anyway, we've got this large blue area, which I've called P, at 5 times 10 to the 12 metric tons. Now, 
this is the reason it was difficult to get numbers for this. I wanted numbers in something actual physical, actual mass. It's very easy to find these numbers in terms of dollars, uh, but that doesn't tell you actually how many how much stuff is being made, how many protons and neutrons are involved, you know, the things that weigh things. Um, anyway, we've got this enormous great blue area, five times 10 to the 12 tons global annual manufacturing, and then there's this tiny little orange sliver that you can just see at three o'clock there, which I've called EP, and I'll explain what P and EP mean in a minute, and that's almost a thousand times smaller. What are these two types of manufacturing? Well, they're these. P stands for phenotype. Your phenotype is the color of your eyes, your height, or if you were an oak tree, it's the shape of your leaves, or if you're a whale, it's the fact that you have fins to swim in the sea. If you're a bacterium, it's that you have a flagellum that allows you to swim through water. Your phenotype is the body that you have if you're a living organism. It's the thing that's built by your, in the instructions in your genes. Um, and the great global manufacturing activity that happens on this planet is nothing to do with human beings. It's living things growing. It makes an enormous amount of stuff growing does. The tiny little orange sliver is not things growing. It's something called the extended phenotype of different animals. Uh, animals mainly, one or two plants have extended phenotypes as well. The idea of an extended phenotype was originally created by uh, the biologist Richard Dawkins, who's a very famous biologist, of course. Um, and what it is, is living things like birds and human beings, not growing, but making things from material they find lying around. Let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Extended phenotype manufacturing, here it is. Um, we all know how this works in nature. Um, birds go out and they gather together sticks and leaves and bits of moss and they build themselves a nest. And exactly the same thing is done by human beings. We go out and dig in the ground and dig up iron ore and instead of making nests we turn it into motor cars or indeed we make a nest for ourselves and here we are all sitting in one of those nests that we've manufactured. This is part of our human extended phenotype. What extended phenotype manufacturing is, is self-replicating machines birds are machines, we're machines, all living things are machines, uh, self-replicating machines building useful items from stuff they find lying about, ultimately. And as I say, this is a tiny part of all the manufacturing that happens in the world. It's almost nothing compared to plants and animals and microbes growing. So, we can see that self-replication allows vast wealth production. That's the natural world compared to extended phenotype production. Self-replication is really incredibly effective at making things. And as I say, the reason why farming stays distributed among people is because of this incredible efficiency of self-replication. Farming uniquely is concerned with self-replicating items as part of its manufacturing process. All other engineering, all other manufacture is all extended phenotype production. It's all manufacturing, not using self-replication. Well, this prompts an obvious question to us. How can we transfer the power of self-replication from farming into engineering? If self-replication, if the living world, if growing things makes so much manufactured material, how can we use that in engineering uh, in order to make engineering as effective as the, national, as, the, as the natural world. And an obvious question that follows from that question is, if we do that, what will it mean for industry? How will industry change if we start to use self-replication in order to manufacture things? Well, this is where I sort of come in. Um, the idea of a self-replicating machine, an artificial self-replicator, certainly is not mine. It goes way back in history, certainly to a conversation between the philosopher René Descartes and Queen Christina of Sweden. Um, Descartes maintained that living things uh, were machines, and Chris Queen Christina asked him, well, see to that clock that it reproduces itself, or see to the, that it has babies. Um, she thought she'd found an argument against Descartes. Um, it was a good argument at the time, and it's still not a bad one. She was a very, very, very gifted and intelligent woman. 
My small contribution to this is the RepRap project. RepRap is short for replicating Rapid Prototyper. Rapid Prototyper is what some engineers call a 3D printer. Um, and here's a picture of one. Uh, this is a RepRap, which is called Lorentz. Most 3D printers that I personally get to name, I call after biologists because they're all self-replicating 3D printers. Um, and that 3D printer you can see in the picture there, all, all the white parts of it that you can see are parts that it prints for itself. So it doesn't make all of itself. In fact, it makes 65% of itself, this particular one, which is not bad going. Um, you probably think that you grew yourselves and that you're entirely self-made. This is not quite the case. In fact, human beings make 60% of themselves, uh, the reason for this is straightforward. Um, you are made by and from proteins, and proteins are made of amino acids. There are 20 amino acids, and you and I, all of us, can only make 12 of those amino acids, 60%. The other 40% we have to get from our food, uh, that we rely on other living organisms to manufacture that 40% of ourselves. Now, if this was a machine that just printed itself, that might be intellectually interesting, but it wouldn't be much use. Um, but it doesn't just print itself. It's like the products of farming, like wheat and cows, uh, which also copy themselves, but they make useful stuff for us in addition to that. Wheat makes bread, cows make milk, and we eat and drink the bread and the milk. Um, all the self-replicating species that we use in our agriculture don't just copy themselves, they also produce something useful, meat, cotton, whatever it might be for us to use. And RepRap is just the same. Uh, when RepRap 3D printer is not copying itself, then it's producing goods which are useful for people in other ways. Maybe a calculator cover, maybe a comb, maybe a cat flap for your cat to go through in your door, all manner of different objects the machine can make. Uh, the name of this particular machine is RepRap Lorentz. Uh, Lorentz is the name that I chose for it. It's after Conrad Lorentz, the noted zoologist. Um, all the rep rap machines I get to name are named after biologists because biology is the study of things that copy themselves. And one final point to make about rep raps is that they're fully open source. Uh, in this case, all the designs for the machine, all the documentation, all the software and so on is all available under the GPL open source license. And the reason I did that when I started the rep rap project and I've carried on with it ever since uh, is because if you have a machine that copies itself, it's kind of crazy to try and patent it. If you patent a machine that copies itself, what you're saying to the world is, here's a machine that copies itself. Now don't copy it, which is, I mean, I've got better things to do with my time. Um, so I decided to open source it completely so that anybody can make copies of this machine. Uh, and indeed, you can find the design for that online if you want. Okay, well, anyone with a plant can grow a seed for a friend, obviously. So if you're growing seeds in your garden, you can grow those, the, grow the plants in your garden, rather. You can take the seeds of those plants and give them to your friend, and your friend can then grow the same plants. Um, anyone with a rep rap can make another rep rap for a friend. And there's a picture of the very first rep rap replication. There's me on the left, as you can see. And um, that rep rap machine that is there is the very first rep rap machine that we manufactured using a conventional 3D printer. Um, that's the parent machine. And the machine on the right, the parts for it were printed on the machine on the left. And the man on the right is a man called Vic Oliver from New Zealand. And he's another guy on the rep rap project. And that very first replication happened on the 29th of May, uh, nine years ago, as you can see. Um, when we put the second machine together, the very first replicated machine, um, Sadly, it didn't work. But the reason it didn't work was nothing to do with the design of the machine. We'd actually made a mistake. We'd cut one of its drive belts too long, so it was too slack. And we found that if we just held a screwdriver against it to tension the belt, the machine worked perfectly. So we immediately sat down, and we designed a belt tensioner for the machine. We printed it out, and we fitted it to the machine, and then it worked fine from then on. Now, this illustrates something that you get sort of for free with any self-replicating machine, which is self-repair. If a machine can replicate itself, it can repair itself, or if it's so broken that it can't work at all, then another 
self-replicating machine can make parts for the first. So it's inherently self-repairing, this technology. I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk about economies of scale, and I'm sure this is an idea with which you're all familiar. Um, on the left is a picture of a traditional blacksmith's workshop, and five or six hundred years ago, if you wanted a shoe for your horse or if you wanted a hinge for your gate, you went to this man, and it always was a man in those days, um, and he would make you those things. And there was one of these people uh, in every village and perhaps several in each town to service the needs of everybody who needed metal objects manufactured for them. Um, and this was a distributed form of manufacturing. Uh, if one of these blacksmiths was ill in your village, you could probably go to the next village and get the blacksmith there to make you a hinge for your gate. Uh, all right, you had to ride your horse over there, but that wasn't a big deal. Um, so it was a rather robust way of making things, but it wasn't very economic. And Adam Smith and subsequently other economists, economists have pointed out that if you gather together large numbers of people in one place and dedicate their activities to doing a particular, uh, uh, achieving, sorry, to achieving a particular result, uh, then that's much more economic. And on the right, we've got a picture of a 19th century iron foundry, which is doing the same thing as the blacksmith, but on a vast scale. And the metal items that that iron foundry made were much cheaper as a consequence because of all the, all the savings that were possible because of economies of scale uh, than the items produced by the blacksmith. But, and here's the most important point, life doesn't always move in that direction. We don't always take small activities and gather them together to make the same activity work more efficiently with large economies of scale in big factories. Sometimes, when a technology gets cheap enough, and when it gets simple enough, and by simple I don't mean it's internally simple, I mean it's simple to use, cheap and simple technology reverses economies of scale. So again in the 19th century, on the left hand side there we've got a picture of a laundry in London, and our great grandparents, when our cl their clothes got dirty, used to parcel them up and send them to the laundry in the town, and then three days later they'd come back clean. Now none of us do that anymore because we've all got a robot in our kitchen to wash our clothes, um, it's there on the right, and when our clothes get dirty, all we do is we throw them in the hole in the front, put a bit of soap in it and press the button, and come back an hour later and hang them out to dry. Very simple process, um, very convenient, much more convenient and quick than sending it to a centralized laundry. And most interestingly, after washing our clothes, that robot that washes them spends about 90, 95% of its time idle. We're perfectly happy to buy that robot and have it do nothing most of the time. And we've taken an economy of scale, the town laundry, and we've taken it back to ourselves. And the same thing is happening, for example, with electricity generation. If you look on the roof outside, you'll find there's an array of solar panels. This building generates some of the electricity that is running these lights in here now. We used to generate electricity in large two gigawatt power stations, like the one on the left there, but nowadays many of us generate our own electricity uh, because this has again become convenient and cheap and it's been distributed. And this gives much more robustness. Just as the, the, old, uh, the old single iron worker, the old blacksmith, um, when he worked, you could go to the next village to get something made when he was sick. Similarly, if the water supply to the town laundry fails, everybody's clothes stay dirty. If your washing machine robot fails, you just go next door and the next door neighbor will wash your clothes for you. Distributed system is much more robust. Distributed electricity generation is also much more robust. Well, this carries over into various other areas. Today, everyone has their own CD pressing plant. You all have one. Uh, you all have a photographic lab of your own. Uh, you all have a printing press of your own. Of course, they don't look like those traditional versions of these things. They are all incorporated in your computer. Um, but nonetheless, that's something that used to be run at centralized economies of scale manufacturing facility, which you've now taken back to yourselves, distributed amongst ourselves. It's something that's run individually. Well, if we're doing that, why not take manufacturing itself, production, and 
take that back down, back to the individual level, and have everybody run their own factory. And if we're going to have everybody run their own factory, let's make sure that it's a factory that makes more factories. Because that will allow us to do, with the whole of manufacturing wealth creation, what agriculture has forced on the economies of agriculture. Agriculture stays distributed among many, many farmers all over the world because I contend, and it's, it's, it is only a hypothesis of mine, remember, I contend it stays distributed because agriculture deals with things that copy themselves. When our manufacturing facilities copy themselves, then wealth creation will be similarly distributed amongst many of us as agriculture is currently. And this will, I hope, have the effect of evening out the spread of wealth rather than causing it to be concentrated in one or two people's hands. Because the economies of scale that we saw earlier is the thing that effectively also accommodate, uh, 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 also um, uh, causes wealth to be uh, accumulated in large amounts in one place. Uh, there is only one Facebook. Billions of people are subscribed to it. That's an economy of scale. Um, and the wealth all goes to Mark Zuckerberg in that case. So, if we make our manufacturing based on self-replication, the effect of that should be to cause wealth distribution to be more even than it is at the moment, because the people who are creating the wealth will be more widespread, and it will be done at a more individual level. And the simplicity of doing it that way, as these machines become as easy to use as a washing machine is to use, should allow large numbers of people to take part in industrial manufacturing without manufacturing being concentrated in one big Toyota factory or one big Boeing factory. Now, I'm not saying that people are going to be making international, intercontinental aircraft uh, in their own spare bedroom. That's clearly not going to happen in the near future. But I can certainly envisage a future where a small group of people, perhaps 10, each with their own 3D printing facilities, could print all the parts needed for an electric car for one of them. And that would be a fairly significant change in the way automobile manufacture happens. So, if we have self-replicating machines and we base our manufacture on self-replication, that should lead to a greater, more even distribution of the creation of wealth. That's pretty much all I have to say. If you want to know more, point your phones at that, and uh, that will take you to the website. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you very much.